So let me welcome you. My name is Rod Smola, and I am the president of Vermont Law and Graduate School. And it is a pleasure to welcome you here and to serve as your moderator for tonight's forum. The forum is presented by the Vermont Law and Graduate School, the Bethel Area Rotary Club, the Bethel, the Bethel Public Library, and the Bethel Town Meeting and Community Engagement Committee. Uh, the goal of the forum is to enrich and inform the democratic process by providing the opportunity for you citizens to listen to the candidates for the three Senate seats at large in the Windsor Senate District to the Vermont Senate, and to listen to the two candidates for the Orange District number two, one, more commonly known as the Royalton Tumbridge House District to the Vermont House of Representatives. I've been asked to acknowledge two other members of the leadership of this state that are present today, Kevin Blakeman from Sharon and Kurt White from Bethel. The forum for tonight's, uh, or the rules, the format for tonight's uh, forum have been explained to the candidates in advance, but I'm gonna add a little reinforcer. <laughs> So, because we have so many candidates, nine, seven for the Senate seats and two for the House of Representatives, I'm gonna admonish you to follow the rule of law and stay within your one minute time limits. We're fortunate to have one of our students, Emily Starobin, right in front of you here in the yellow shirt. She has a timer and it will go uh, the minute you are recognized and run for 60 seconds. So I know you'll wanna make eye contact with the audience, but you might want a little glance down at where you are. At the 60 second mark, I will cut you off. <laughs> for those of you in the audience, I urge you to try a little multitasking if the spirit moves you. There are cards on your seats, and you are invited, if you wish, to pose a question to the candidates. If you choose to write out a question, you can simply hold it up. We have two other students from the law school here, Isaiah Gonzalez and Willow Hogan, and they will serve as runners. They'll take your questions uh, on, on index cards and give them to the organizers of the debate who will select the questions for me to ask during that segment of the debate. Obviously, we won't have time for all of the questions to be asked, but it might well be that if your question's not asked, you'll be able to approach the candidates if they're willing afterwards, and they may wish to just informally um, do the best they can to answer the question for you. For the benefit of the candidates again, but more importantly, for your benefit in the audience, here is the format. In a few minutes, we'll do the first segment in which each candidate will be given one minute to introduce himself or herself uh, and make an opening statement. And we'll have the seven Senate candidates go first and then our two candidates for the House. After each of the candidates has made an opening statement, we will move to the second segment of the forum the second segment will consist of three questions that the forum organizers have asked me to put to all the candidates. The candidates have seen those questions in advance, and each candidate will have one minute to answer each of those three questions. We'll then move to the third part of the forum at 7 o'clock. So get those index cards in the air between now and seven, or you'll be shut out. And at seven o'clock, I'll take the questions that you have posed, the ones that have been selected by the organizers, and pose those questions to the candidates. And then at 7.30, we will hear closing statements from each of the nine candidates. And at 7.45, we will be adjourned. Now for the benefit of the candidates, I have scrambled the order in which I will call on you 
for each of these various segments so that it's not the same person going first each time, not the same person going last each time. I've randomized this. So by the end of the night, each of you should go first once, likely, last once, and somewhere in the middle at various different times. Um, so with that, let us begin. And I'm going to open by asking each of our seven senatorial candidates to take one minute for an opening statement. And for this segment, I'll ask Becca White to go first. But one more point, Becca, before you go. We have some incumbents, and we have people that are not incumbents. I'm going to use no titles tonight. I'll refer to all of you simply by your first and last names. And so, Becca White, please go ahead. OK. Well, thank you, President Smola. We really appreciate you hosting us. Thank you to the law school for hosting us as well. Really appreciate We can clap. Come on. Go law school. Thank you, Cindy Metcalf, in particular. And before I introduce myself, we missed one very important person in the audience, which is Senator Dick McCormick, who is retiring. And we should just all say thank you to Senator Dick McCormick. Um, so my name is Becca White. I'm from the town of Hartford. I grew up in the village of Wilder, and I am one of your current state senators. Uh, in the audience is my fantastic husband, Dylan, who will hopefully wave. Um, and we both live in the village of White River Junction. Uh, I grew up in Wilder as a low-income uh, student. As my mom would describe, uh, we were poor. <laughs> and as my dad would describe, we were no frills. Uh, so I understand what it means to live. Oh, am I done? OK, there you go. Nice to meet you. I'm hoping to be reelected. Jonathan Gleason, can you go next? Thank you very much. My name is Jonathan Gleason. I'm from uh, Ludlow, and I'm running for Senate. My educational background is a bachelor's in geological engineering. My specialty was hydrogeology and environmental reclamation. I have a master's in general business from Babson College. So I'm well versed in things like budgets, finance, marketing, all of that sort of stuff. My career spans several different aspects. I was at first hired by a large multinational company and I've worked overseas for several years and then I came back to the United States and I worked in a very small business for years and years. I ended up buying this small business and running it for a decade and a half. I successfully sold it, and the new owner is doing quite well at the moment. I'm interested in running for Senate. I'm focusing on affordability. That seems to be the recurring theme. Thank you, Jonathan. I'll next ask Mark Nemeth to speak. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Mark Nemeth. I'm running for state senator as an independent. I'm doing that because I'm trying to offer a solution to folks who have been somewhat concerned about the fact that everything seems to be bipartisan these days. So I'm going to be running on a ticket where I'm going to be an independent that can really respond to everybody's needs. I believe in representing people and not parties. I've been here since 1990, lived in South Royals, and I graduated VLS. I've engaged in public service, and those who know me know that I do that without any expectation of recognition or any kind of compensation. I served as a local constable for many, well, not many years, probably six or so years. And I was pretty fundamental in establishing the Royal Oakland Police Department. I also work as an attorney down in White River. And I do a lot of public service. I really won't be able to do justice in one minute, but I invite you all, if you take some time to get to know me, and I invite you to call me, I'd be able to do a better job than this one minute. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next, we'll hear from Allison Clarkson. Thank you for inviting us to this forum. It's great to be here. I'm Allison Clarkson. I'm currently the Senate Majority Leader, and I have served in the legislature for 20 years, 12 in the House and 8 in the Senate. Uh, I moved to Woodstock, Vermont, uh, so that my husband, Oliver Goodenough, who's right there waving, uh, could follow his bliss and become a professor here at Vermont Law School. Uh, we are the proud parents of two incredible young men. Uh, before moving to Vermont, I worked in the entertainment industry. I was a theater and uh, television producer. 
I'm running because I believe that at its best, government expresses our care and concern for each other and undertakes projects that need to be common endeavors. We care for each other in so many ways, in educating our young, <clears throat> building roads and bridges, protecting our environment, to investing in innovation and workforce training, all things which are common goods. I'm proud of my work as a legislator, helping improve the lives of Vermonters and protecting Vermont's environment. Thank, Thank you, you. Allison. And we'll next hear from Joe Major. That would be the guy next to you. Hello, my name is Joe Major, and I am running for state senate and trying to fill the big shoes of Dick McCormick. I'm currently the executive director of the Upper Valley Aquatic Center and also the treasurer of the town of Hartford. While at Hartford, I was the vice chair of the select board there, and there's probably the extent of my um, elected official title. I've been in the health and fitness field for over 30 years. Now, I know what you're saying to yourself, he looks too young to be that old. But one of the reasons why I am running for state senate is a motto that the Rotary taught me, service above self. I was the president of the White River Rotary, and so thank you Rotarians in here in putting this together. Thank you, Joe. We'll next hear from Andrea Murray. Hello, Hello everyone. Um, it's a lot to put in one minute. So um, I'm from Weathersfield. I am a farmer there. I raise beef cattle and chickens, and I'm a wife. I'm a mother of a middle schooler. I'm a businesswoman. And I understand the firsthand the challenges that our um, Vermonters are facing with these soaring um, costs of living, rising violent crime, and the public school system that continues to fail our children despite the ever increasing taxes and spending. Governor Scott called for moderate legislators to um, work together, and I'm answering that call. Um, the background includes healthcare and banking, um, my farm, I'm deeply connected with my community, I'm on part of the zoning board, <laughs> and I volunteer locally. Affordability is of course the heart of our cam my campaign, and probably most everyone, it's on everyone's mind. Our priorities are to lower taxes and to reform the way we fund our schools, create a more affordable for Vermont and more affordable housing, and I am. Thank you, Andrea, thank you. And our last Senate candidate is Jack Williams. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jack Williams. I'm running as a Vermont Senate candidate. I'm from uh, the little town of Perkinsville, which is located in the uh, town of Wethersfield, the southern end of uh, Windsor County. Um, I feel it's the civic duty of every person to support your state and your government in any capacity you can. That's why I'm chosen at this time to run for the Senate. Um, I served as a non-commissioned officer in the military for 20 years. I served as a uh, civil engineering technician for the Vermont Agency of Transportation for 30 years. And in both of these positions, I held leadership positions and positions of responsibility. I feel that qualifies me to run as your state representative. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And so as you probably know, there are three seats that will be sent to the Senate from the Windsor District, but only one seat for the House of Representatives uh, Orange District number one. We have two candidates, Bruce Post and John O'Brien. And Bruce and John, I'll try to remember to just go back and forth. One will go first one time, the other will go first the other time, and hopefully I'll keep it straight. So let's begin with your opening statements. And Bruce Post, I'll ask you to go first. Well, good evening, everybody. We'll see how this goes on the clock here. Um, Bruce Post, I live on the north end of town. I'm a dairy farmer, lived there my whole life so far. Um, motor coach operator to make some real money to keep the farm going. But the, one of the reasons that I stepped forward is I've, I've 
done some public service, but I feel not enough. So there was a void and I, I stepped in to hopefully fill that void and give people a choice. Um, main things I'm looking to do in Montpelier is uh, help restore some common sense, help make Vermont safer, more affordable, and help restore a voice for the common working people. And I got 20 seconds left, man. <laughs> tell a joke or something. Um, I'm just really looking forward to being able to hear from, from folks and bring people in Montpelier together to, to get some ideas, bring the best of what we got and take those ideas and put together something that'll work for Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and now we'll hear from John O'Brien. Thank you. Oh, good evening. My name's John O'Brien. I'm from Tunbridge. I'm the incumbent state representative to this district. It's Windsor Orange one, because Windsor, of course, is Royalton, and, and Tunbridge is in Orange County. Um, I've served for six years, three terms, um, all on house agriculture, food resiliency, and forestry. Um, I'm married to Emily Howe. Uh, we have two sons, one twenty, one seventeen. Um, I'm on the select board in Tunbridge. Uh, for over a decade. Um, Emily and I run a wedding business on our farm, and, and like Bruce, I still live on the same farm I grew up on, so that's pretty unusual for two candidates. Um, and the reason I'm running again for a fourth term is that I feel I have the experience, finally, it takes a while to learn what goes on in Montpelier, but I finally have experience enough to, I think, get a lot done for this district. Um, and I'm a problem solver. Same reason I serve on the select board. I'm a problem solver and, uh, and consensus builder. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you to the candidates for being so civilized and orderly. And that will only give us more time to interact with the audience. It's amazing how much content you can squeeze into one minute, isn't it? So now we will go through the second segment of the forum. Uh, the organizers of the forum have prepared three questions for me to ask, and I will ask each question and then go through the seven Senate candidates and get their responses and the two House candidates and get their responses. And so here is the first question. Who are you voting for for President of the United States and why? If you're undecided, why? So we'll again begin with the candidates on the Senate side, and I'll ask Jack Williams this time to go first. Currently, I'm undecided which candidate I'm going to vote for. I'm, I'm waiting for the Democrat candidate to provide us with a clear uh, vision policy of her candidacy. Once she does that, I'll decide on which candidate will best serve the, this country as far as border security, our taxes, and so on. And uh, then I'll make my decision at that time which candidate I'll vote for. Thank you. Thank you. We'll next hear from Andrea Murray. So all voters have the legal right to cast a secret ballot in election, and this is vital for our system of self-government. Privacy in elections guards against intimidation, coercion, and threats. I'll make that decision on November 5th in the privacy of a ballot box. I choose not to forfeit my right to privacy today. I am disappointed this forum is focusing on this time to, for distracting questions, and it's avoiding the real issues that every single Vermonter that I've spoken to since I've um, decided to run for Senate is the affordability crisis. It's caused, an unchecked, caused by an unchecked checked supermajority that refuses to collaborate or compromise on spending. Our state house has failed for moderns. That's why I'm advocating for balance. Democrats have three Senate seats for 30 years. The election is when you choose three senators. I'm asking for one of your choices. It's time for a fiscally responsible senator to be a, represent Windsor District. Thank you. Our next candidate will be Joe Major. Thank you very much. I'm probably the only candidate here that has an actual relationship 
with one of the candidates running for president. I did go to school with Kamala Harris at Howard University, and when I went there with her, you knew that she was special. She was special when she became a prosecutor in San Francisco, and it's ironic that she is prosecuting against a felon currently. I will also say that I, I cannot, in good conscience, let you go without saying you have to answer the question. Don't dodge the question of who you are voting for, because as elected officials or running for elected officials, one of the things that you do is you completely open yourself up to what your policies and thoughts are. Thank you. Thank you. We will next hear from Allison Clarkson. Thank you. I, I, I honor our secret ballot, but I also feel as a public servant, uh, it's fair for you to know what my values are and where I stand. And I think that's in some ways we forfeit uh, the right to privacy on some of this. Uh, the appeal of the Harris Waltz ticket is just so strong. They are so experienced, uh, and they represent the values that I agree with. And Donald Trump uh, is a convicted felon who is a liar and a threat to our democracy. Uh, he's not a substantive person. We need a serious person for serious times. And Trump, sadly, is a bigoted, uh, belligerent cartoon, and we need a serious president. Thank you. We will next hear from Mark Nemeth. So as an independent, what do I do? Do I appeal to the Republican side of the fence, the Democrat side of the fence? Here's my answer. And I'm going to talk to the Republicans in the room who support Donald Trump, and not so much the Democrats who support Kamala Harris. Look, if you're going to elect a candidate, you have if you're going to elect a candidate, you have to pick someone who will represent the people and not themselves. And you have to ask yourself, what is an individual's primary focus? Is it themselves or is it others? And you look at their service. And when I compare Kamala Harris to Donald Trump, I look at Kamala Harris's service, and I think we all should. But I also ask folks to think about the division that, that is sown by a particular candidate. We need to unify. I think our best chance is with Kamala Harris. And I say that as independent. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> we'll next hear from Jonathan Gleason. I'm a firm believer, as an American, that united we stand and divided we fall. Unfortunately, what I didn't see from either one of the major party candidates was an olive branch, even the semblance of a bridge. There is no togetherness in their speeches. I didn't find them to be compelling to me to vote for either one of the major parties. As a Republican, I'm not scared of dividing away from my party. I won't simply vote along party lines. I'm a very moderate Republican. I'm undecided who I'm going to vote for yet, but it's not going to be one of the major party candidates. Thank you. And our last senatorial candidate for this question is Becca White. Okay, uh, I'm voting for Kamala Harris. I do think when you become an elected official, you do forfeit your right to some relative privacy. Uh, as a young woman, as an openly queer person, as someone who's concerned about global warming and is disturbed by the racist, xenophobic rhetoric of Donald Trump, I don't feel safe in a world where Donald Trump is elected to our presidency. And I hope that any candidate hoping to represent Windsor County takes into consideration the implications of his presidency on our communities, especially our youngest women, especially our children. I want to just note one thing that was very disturbing to me when I, when I watched the debate, and that was the attack on Haitian immigrants. As a community, we need to respond to those types of derogatory and insulting xenophobic comments. And I hope even if you don't vote for Donald Trump or uh, tell us your vote on it, you will decry those types of Thank xenophobic you, time attacks. Has Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, 
out on the outside. We'll hear you know, first this time from John O'Brien. So when I think of, of MAGA, let's make America great again, um, it seems to want to look back to a time when all the positions of leadership were held by white heterosexual men. I think it's time we had a woman as president of the United States. And now Bruce Post. Okay. Well, I guess it's my turn to step on the pie in the party. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm just entering the political realm, and it appears there are two types of politicians, givers and takers. There are those that serve and those looking for what they can be served by being involved. I think our country needs more leaders willing to serve. And I, for one, see Donald Trump as someone who gave up a lot of goodies in life to serve the people. Now, everybody doesn't agree with that, and it depends on who you listen to. Um, but that's, that's my thoughts, and that's where I'll go with it. And I believe a little thrift and common sense can go a long way in Vermont politics, and that's the realm that I'm interested in. I didn't really want to get into this fight about who you're going to vote for for president, but having heard what's been said, I feel I need to stand up for what I believe. There you go. Thank you. The second question that the forum organizers have asked me to ask the, candidate, the candidates is this. If elected, how will you work to protect Vermonters' access to reproductive health care if there is a national ban on abortion? So we'll begin again with the Senate side, and I'll first call for a response from Allison Clarkson. Thank you. I've already voted to embed uh, reproductive liberty into the Vermont Constitution, and it'll be an interesting uh, case to see how we how that stands if there is a national ban, and it will be an institute, instant, interesting constitutional discussion. But I've also voted uh, to protect women's right and access to health care in, in a variety of other ways, and also to protect the, 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 the women coming to Vermont for reproductive health care and the providers of that health care. So I uh, fully support uh, reproductive liberty and uh, support all the people that are uh, providing it. Thank you. And our next candidate for this issue is Joe Major. As a 60-year-old man, I do not have the right to tell a woman what to do with her body. It is not my right. And I don't want to say that it is abortion, because that's the, the term that we use. It is women's health care. And I'm glad we said reproductive freedom. That has to be the focus of what we do, because I cannot, in good conscience, tell a woman, you cannot do this. I would vote to codify an amendment which is, which is Prop uh, 5, to make sure that women's health care in its fullest state, in its fullest state, is able to stay in Vermont, no matter what is done on the federal level. Thank you. We will next hear from Andrea Murray. The Supreme Court has ruled that this, this is a state's matter, and Vermont has passed Article 22 and this into our Constitution for an afforded personal reproductive liberties. There's, um, so this is a non-issue. There's also a federal law that says that the sale and distribution of cannabis in Vermont is um, illegal, but Vermont has chosen to ignore that. We're going to continue to protect our women's rights and our re reproductive rights. Um, more importantly, I want to work to prevent the kids, the government from gover government overreach, like Act 150 that was sponsored by our two incumbent senators to reduce the age that parents can ex access children's library information to 12 years old. It also ensures sexually explicit materials are available to our children without parent consent. 
This is just one of the activist legislative measures being pushed forward in complete disregard of parents' rights. Amen. Thank you. Our next candidate is Jonathan Gleason. As a candidate, as a man, as a father, I support a woman's right to choose. I find that the laws we have in Vermont are great. It shouldn't change. The status quo is fine. I can't foresee that on a national basis we're going to lose the right to women's health care. That to me is kind of horrifying. I really think education at a young age for the children is the key to reproductive health throughout life. As a young man, I was an exchange student in Sweden. They have the lowest teen pregnancy and STD transfer on the planet. And their children are quite sexually active, or not children, but their teenagers are. And the reason why they're successful is because of education. Education and access to products. Can't take that away. Thank you. We'll next hear from Becca White. Uh, the right to family plan is essential for anyone's ability to pursue happiness. And I was so proud when I got a vote for Prop 5 and enshrined that into our Constitution. I think if you look at the playbook of Project 2025, the chance of us having a national ban on abortion is likely. The stacking of the Supreme Court to have an outcome to overturn Roe v. Wade was a long time coming. It was pre Planned. Having it sent back to the states means you need to have candidates who can confirm to you that they will back legislation that will protect your right to choose. And I'm so grateful that we heard from candidates who did do that today. What was unfortunate is we also heard from candidates who chose to distort the legislation described as Act 151, which provides updated and accurate sexual health information for students at an age-appropriate level. That is the kind of thing that we heard from another candidate in a different national context being beneficial. We'll now hear from Jack Williams. Article 22 of Vermont law guarantees the constitutional right for abortion in the state of Vermont. So their rights are protected. The government currently has uh, put this on the states to decide whether they're going to have abortion or not. So it's protected in Vermont. Uh, so that question, if, if one of the audience wants to bring that up again, I would like to, to farther uh, follow up on that, because at this time I can't really do it in one minute. But uh, basically your rights are protected and they're not going to be taken away. Thank you. Thank you. And our final senatorial candidate on this question is Mark Nemeth. It's going to be hard to do justice on this. There's a lot to be said. So I'm going to start by saying I find an individual's right to make decisions about their own person inviolate. Regardless of which party you're on, we have to protect an individual's right to make decisions about their own future, their own health. So it should be apparent where I stand on um, uh, uh, right to life choices. Having said that, I would like to just briefly talk about health care. I'll try for a few reasons, uh, for, with some few extra seconds later on, I'll try to explain why. Health care is now probably one of the most important um, uh, factors for me as a candidate. And like health care, there's housing and food. These are all basic needs. If we don't protect them as a state, we don't make sure that our, our, our citizens have the ability to access those, those services, health care, housing. We're going to fail our, our, our community. Thank you, Mark. And now for the House race this time, first we'll have Bruce Post. OK, here comes your choice. I think it's. From what I've heard so far, it is settled law. We shouldn't get stuck into weeds trying to fix something we're not going to be able to fix because it's been done. 
We should spend our time trying to make Vermont more affordable. People have a chance to live here. Uh, the only other thing that I'll say is who's going to fight for the rights of the unborn? And finally, John O'Brien. I support a woman's right to choice. Um, I voted for Proposition 5. Um, the one story I wanted to tell quickly was um, there was a representative, George Till, who was a doctor at UVM, an OBGYN, and it was great in the House when we had debates about abortion and women's health to hear someone who actually knew what he was talking about. And it reminds me of, of the story about Haitians eating cats. There is so much misinformation and, and sort of mean-spirited things that goes on in this world that it's very hard to have, have an open conversation about this. I mean, I think both sides you know, wanna, wanna have something happen, but, but no, nobody can even agree on what the facts are. So um, I'm, I'm glad it's gonna be in our Constitution, and I'm, I'm really proud of Vermont that we've protected a woman's right to choose. Thank you. So again, for those of you in the audience, remember you have the opportunity to write a question or put it on an index card and hold it up. Uh, we'll be getting to that segment in about uh, 15 minutes. So if a question has occurred to you, having listened um, to these folks, please don't be shy about writing it out and um, letting one of our students retrieve it from you. The final question that our organizers have posed is a very general question. And so the candidates, you have a lot of flexibility to amplify um, anything you've set up to now or anything new that you want to add. This, along with your closing statements at the end, give you um, really the option yourselves to direct um, this discussion in the way that you think is most productive. So here is the issue, and the candidates can interpret it as you like. What issue is motivating you most to want to serve in the Vermont legislature? Again, we'll begin with the Senate candidates, and the first candidate I'll call upon is Joe Major. Excuse me. When I started out on this, this road to possibly be one of your senators, um, my focus was education, community safety, and housing. And they still are important to me. But as I traveled through the county, I found Unfortunately, the, the taxation on property overwhelmingly was the number one issue. And that is probably a forefront issue that we have to solve immediately. We have to roll up our sleeves and figure out how we calculate how much each student is worth. We have to make some hard decisions. Do we combine schools? Those are the things that we have to look at to make sure that we drive down taxes. And we also have to look at the governor when he extends his hand and says, you know what, I want to work with you. Is he really working with you? Thank you, Joe. Your time has expired. Thank you. We'll next hear from Mark Nemeth. Hey. So I'm not going to box myself into one topic or one um, issue. I'm simply going to say that my priority when I serve in Montpelier is to unify our legislature. We like to believe they work together, but they don't really at this point. We still have two parties. There's still a huge level of divisiveness. I think my focus is going to be on just trying to get common sense and, and cooperation in the Senate. Then we can focus on the really important topics of housing, health care, taxation, um, criminal, uh, crime in Vermont, and, and police services. Hey, I have 15 seconds left. Hmm. So let's pick one that's, that's actually substantive, housing. If we don't start helping folks get into housing, we are going to have some really big problems. I like to focus on that. Maybe I'll tell you at some point later on how. Thank you. Our next candidate is Andrea Murray. So most importantly, we need to make Vermont affordable again. I'm running because I watched at the veto sessions 
one bill after another that um, our governor has um, vetoed overridden. And our Governor Scott is the most popular governor in the United States. And our, we have a separation of powers for a reason. And right now, our, um, their system is failing because the current supermajority has the power to force an activist special interest agenda on Vermont without fiscal restraint, without collaboration, and without discussion with the other side. Um, this, we, they're trying to extract the most money possible with new taxes, new fees, in order to, um, without the thought of reduced spending. We, we have to fix our affordability issues, and that happens with collaboration. That happens with a balanced government where they're forced to negotiate and give and take to get the best bills possible and the best legislation possible to speak for all Vermont. Thank Vermont you, Andrea. Voices. We're next here from Becca White. Uh, the main issues that I'm concerned with are what we call the three E's. It's economic, environmental, and equity. Those are the things that really wake me up in the morning. Um, growing up here in Windsor County, I'm very familiar with the economic realities of living here. One of the topics that has already come up, thank you, Joe, is property uh, taxes. And one of the bills that I'll be working on this next session is taxing second homeowners, vacation homes, slash rentals, at a greater rate to the residential full-time residents that we have here. Um, that's a big priority of mine. Um, housing is kind of the the bucket that that falls in uh, because we do not have enough housing for the people who are here now and we certainly don't have enough housing for the people who want to be here who we need here to fill basic workforce essential jobs um, the last thing which we haven't spent a lot of time on but we're here at the law school is environmental justice we must respond to the climate crisis in a way that is equitable thank you thank you our next candidate is jack williams What primary issue are you running on? Now, I have a number of issues I'm running on, but primarily, I think like all of the candidates, we're all running on the tax problems. Now, in Vermont, right now, the, the different taxes we're faced with is property tax, which is the biggest one. We have taxes on home heating fuel coming up. We have uh, double-digit premium for our health care insurance coming up, and new payroll taxes. These are the, the taxes in the last few years that have come up. And that is the primary reason that I'm running at this time. Thank you. And our next candidate is Jonathan Gleason. My primary issue is affordability. I work predominantly with younger people, and all of them complain to me, I can't afford to live here. When I talk to people trying to move to Vermont, they can't afford to live here. When I'm out and about, people are complaining and complaining about the affordability issue. Traveling around and talking to people, I've found that Vermont is one of only three states in America that allow the legislature to up your property tax by whatever they choose year after year. The other two states, surprisingly, are Tennessee and New Hampshire. I believe that what we need to start to think about is having some sort of stop on how much your property taxes can go up year over year. Looking at the budget, we really need to look at it as a small businessman. Thank you. candidate on this question is Allison Clarkson. Thank you. I mean, there's so many issues, it's just hard to choose. But I, I over well, overarchingly, I want to protect and promote the well-being of Vermonters and of the residents of the Windsor District. Uh, my interest in serving is motivated by wanting to help improve the lives of Vermonters and <clears throat> our constituents in the Windsor District in housing, education, environment, health care, public safety, economic development, and whatever else arises during our very busy and full legislative session. 
there's much to discuss in affordability, and there are two sides to that issues, costs and revenues. So we have much to discuss. I hope we will be discussing affordability uh, in, a fuller, in a fuller way and taxation in a fuller way. Thank you. And we'll now hear from John O'Brien. I think we are all agreed here. Um, affordability and taxes is probably the number one issue here. Um, and, and I think there's just a lot of education on affordability and taxes that we need to cover that, that seems most people don't understand how we get to this point where property tax went up 14%. It's because we all voted for school budgets and they, they total all the school budgets at the end of the year and that bill goes to the legislature and it has to be paid. And so the thankless ones of us who voted for that bill, we were voting for something we don't, none of us want property taxes to go up by 14%, but it was an education bill that had to be paid. So we have to look at what makes schools so expensive and all of us have to be involved in that conversation. And if we're gonna do that, we have to have better results in our schools. At the moment, our schools are pretty mediocre. Thank you. And our next candidate for this third question is Bruce Post. Thank you. Yeah, I think finally we kind of all agree on something. Um, it's just a matter of how we're going to get it done. And one of the things I'd like to focus on more than has been lately is the cost of things. And why do things cost so much? And are there better ways that we can do what we've been doing? And we just sticking band-aids on old programs and just keep moving them ahead and collecting more money because we need more money to keep these things going. Um, maybe we should go back and, and look at the, the whole thing and, and try to decide how we should best run that. Um, so yeah, it's taxation, that's taxation and affordability are the, the big things that I'm interested in. And like Cal Coolidge said, collecting more taxes than is absolutely necessary. I forget what word he used, but it, he didn't like it. So, thank you. So what's your guess? How many index cards do you think surfaced? How many questions? 25. So I've done the calculation, 26, 27. You gotta put those behind So I've done the calculation, so just plan to be here till one in the morning, okay? <laughs> we'll only have time for a few, but what I will offer as the moderator is we at the Vermont Law and Graduate School will transcribe all of these, put them online, and candidates are free to respond in other forums and other ways that you might choose. I'm sure it's important for you to hear what are on folks' minds. So we'll do that as a public service. We won't, we'll anonymize them. We won't use your names. And, uh, and so what we don't get to in this next round, um, you'll have a chance to address in other, in other <coughs> settings. Um, so here is the first question. And I will say I've had a chance to go through a few of them very quickly. And you'll find them to be down the middle of the many issues that many of you have already said you think are enormously important. Um, so the first question is, and by the way, the handwriting is very good. I'm being, you may think our schools are failing, but not so bad in penmanship, OK? Here's the first question. What specifically will the candidates do to ensure Vermont stays affordable and a viable option for all generations? And for this question, let me first call on Jonathan Gleason. As a former small businessman, I was lucky to work through the good times, but I also had to work through really, really tough times. I've had to make the hard decisions, what things had to go, who had to go, how to save some money to keep the company afloat. I see it the same way with our budget. We can't keep asking you folks to raise your taxes, to pay us more, to pay for all the things we want to pay for. We're going to have to make hard, hard decisions and it's going to get harder and harder. Some of the things that we can probably do in the legislature are roll back some of the regulations. For example, our insurance keeps going up. One of the reasons for that is the insurance companies by law now need to keep a certain amount of capital 
liquid so that they can pay claims in a timely manner. That's great, and it affords us fast payments. But what it does is raise the rates for all of us. There's lots of things like that that we can start to look at. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next candidate is Andrea Murray. Well, the, 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 the question, Andrea, is what will you do to ensure that Vermont stays affordable and a viable option for all generations? There's so many things, but the one thing that we can do to make it more, more affordable is we need to stop asking who can pay more money, and we need to start looking at where's our money going. We have millions of dollars of new taxes. One, the, the child care tax that all of the employees now have to pay. If you look into the information, as of 1 October, you get the person that's earning 575% of poverty level qualifies for child care subsidies. That's $220,000. With $1 million in assets, you get to have subsidized child care. So there are places where we can lower the money that we're giving out in order to provide services where they're much more needed for people that are hungry, people that don't have places to stay, for warm spaces that we're going to need very soon because people aren't going to be able to afford to heat their homes. Thank you. Thank you. We'll next hear from Mark Nemeth. I don't have a degree in economics, but I think this is one of those where common sense really comes to play. We need to really prioritize the most important things that, to spend our money on. And that requires that we make our spending in government more efficient. One of my pet peeves, I was very focused on the housing program and, and, and the hotel program, and hotel owners were getting up $80 a night and $2,400 a month to provide one individual with housing, uh, with, with, with housing. I can't help but think there were other ways to spend that money and accomplish so much more. So I'm gonna tell you that when I go up, I'm gonna to try to reach out to everybody in the legislature to try to emphasize how important it is to spend the money that we have to get our best maximal benefit and not rely so much on taxation. And that's about it. Thank you. We'll next hear from Becca White. I think it's interesting that we've already heard identified early childhood education and public schooling as the places people really want to investigate and have efficiency in, because that scares me. When I think about where we heard Governor Phil Scott suggest that we cut the budget, it was in the program that funded school children getting free lunches. That's not a program that I'm willing to cut. But what I am willing to do is look at how we can more equitably fund the basic services that we need to provide. That would be through what I already told you about with the second homeowners, having them pay a greater extent of the cost burden because they are not contributing in the same way that a resident is by living full time or being a part of the workforce. The other idea I have is moving away from the gas tax. So you pay a gas tax whenever you buy gas at the at the gas station um, and that is a very regressive tax the people who pay the most money are usually the lowest income folks because they have the highest gas guzzling cars we're also seeing a thank decrease you, in our gas revenue so we must thank you your time is expired and now we'll hear from Jack Sorry. Williams taxes what we need to do is to Put, look at putting caps on different taxes. Instead of continually raising them, put a cap on them, take the state budget, and go through the state budget, line item by line item, and eliminate all the waste in the state budget. And lost my train of thought. <laughs> but anyway, uh, go through the budget, line item by line item, and put a cap on taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate on this question is Allison Clarkson. Thank you. <clears throat> Affordability, of course, has two aspects. It's got costs and it's got income. Vermonters across the board are underpaid 20%. I, would, I really want to work 
uh, very hard to continue creating an, an innovative and exciting economy here in Vermont where we can grow uh, our income, which we need to do to be able to also afford you. We also, you know, inflation is largely beyond our control. On the other hand, housing is dry, is the, the cost of housing is really uh, one of the things we have to address. I want to continue to work on housing. I've done a lot of work in this arena, continue to work on created and helping partner building affordable housing, but also create exciting and, and, cre and creative ways to address and build more low-hanging fruit housing and, and turning our big homes into more useful things. I also want to address the taxation of our seasonal residents, our second homeowners, and actually have residents uh, pay, uh, pay slightly differently than our second homeowners. Our second homeowners, it's a luxury to have a second home here, and they need to be taxed uh, accordingly. And short-term rentals, which are all uh, we need to address more fully, which are also taking away full-time housing. And so those, uh, those are you. some of the aspects, but there are two sides to affordability. Thank you. And our final candidate on this issue on the Senate side is Joe Major. So one of the things that I've heard through this forum is that we should work together. The governor, a Republican, should work with the legislature in getting these things done. And so when the governor had an opportunity to do that, particularly with the property taxes, he didn't show up for this meeting. And then his minion said, you know what, we will increase it by 4%. Thus, the schools could not pay their bills, and our credit rating would have gone down, and we would have paid more on the back end. I, my wife loves Judge Judy. And one of the things she, Judge Judy says is, don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. <laughs> Please, be genuine when you want to work together to solve problems. And we don't get that. Thank you. I'm not doing anything with your leg other than making you be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now on the House side, it's John O'Brien's turn. Um, here's a story. Um, there's a guy in Tunbridge who's very conservative. He constantly tells us that we should never raise taxes. And the same guy um, came to town meeting and he said, I propose because of our opioid epidemic and <clears throat> our drug problem that we should spend, we, we generally spend around $5,000 a year, but this guy said we should spend $50,000 on policing to deal with our, our drug problem. And our select board, we said, yes, we have a problem. And I think everybody's really concerned about this. I know in Royalton, same thing. And we said, yeah, good idea. Now, what happens though? That we just we just voted fifty thousand more dollars of property tax that has to be paid for. So these are the sort of things where, let's just be honest. You know, taxes are going to keep going up, but right there's capacity. Hopefully, it's not property tax. Hopefully, it's people who can can pay a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Bruce Post. Okay, yeah, and like I said before, let's take a look at where our money's going, but here's a new idea, and it kind of goes along with what John just said. We have justices of the peace who used to do a lot of things in keeping the peace, and those things that they used to do are, have been taken away from them, and I'm wondering if that would be a wise thing to help with our policing, is to have the justices of the peace do some of the peacekeeping that they used to do. Thank you. Our next question is about public education, and it's a relatively long question. I'm going to distill it a bit for you. Uh, it begins, do you think public education is vital for a functioning democracy? And then secondly, what thoughts do you have specifically about what you think should be done in this state about public education? So let me begin this round with Andrea Murray. Public education, absolutely vital to a thriving economy, any economy, not just a democracy, but 
it's, we need to have our kids educated and working. What would I specifically do? I would rethink shutting down small town schools. I was at the Weathersfield Paw Drop and saw hundreds of family members enjoying this incredible um, event. It brought the, it is the center of your town. There's a town of Cavendish. It has less than 100 students. They will fall into the, the group that will get shut down and kids will have to bus over the mountain to um, Chester in order to go to kindergarten and first grade and second grade. That's an hour bus ride, think about winter. If a town wants their school for their community, they should have a right to do that. And the way that works is not by weighted pupils um, funding, it's by funding pupils um, evenly. We need a base rate for pupils, and then the town, the rate goes above that. There's a way to change this, and it needs to. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we'll hear from Jack Williams. Hopefully I can redeem myself from the last uh, question. Um, yes, public uh, education is vital to a country. One of the things that uh, I hate to see is, is the alternate schools where people are sending their, their children. I feel that, that our public education, our public schools should be adequate enough where all the students go to those schools. As far as funding them, the, um, in, in our, I think the school budget, we need to look at taking away the school budget from property taxes. And I, we, we have the transportation fund. What would be the feasibility of taking the, the and creating in our state budget a education budget totally away from the property tax? And property tax in that case would become just, not, just another form of revenue for the state. Thank you, Jack. Your time is Thank expired. You. Thank you. We'll next hear from Allison Clarks. Public education is the foundation of our democracy. It's essential. And it's essential that we all support it. I wish more of our parents, I mean, in some ways, uh, some our independent schools are very strong, but they also have taken a lot of the strength out of our public schools in terms of the parents and the support of, of families in our public education system. Uh, I'm very proud of our workforce development. I think that public education is our number one workforce development investment in this state. And it's, uh, it, uh, on the whole, uh, education system I'm very proud of. I'm not sure about the one thing I would do to further support it. I think our career and technical education centers are incredible. I mean, they're educating people for a 21st century economy that's very exciting. Um, I think we need to support our public schools more fully than we, than we actually do. We pay lip service to it. And I think we need to really invest time and talent in making our public education system the best in the country. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Joe Major. There is uh, only a finite amount of money to go to our school system. I am not, I am not in favor of giving public money to private institutions. I will also say that there are times that we'll have to make tough decisions. I heard on this panel about smaller schools. There may be a situation where you have a smaller school and if that school district wants to keep them small, maybe they pay a little bit, a little bit more. But I, I will say this, tough decisions have to be made. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot say, you know what, I don't want my property taxes to go up, but not make tough decisions when you, when it comes to the, the school districts. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll next hear from Mark Nemeth. So education is critical. And not education from schools, education on the street. It doesn't matter where you learn, it just matters what you learn. And you know, I was thinking about lawyers. There are a lot of lawyers who go to law school. Who gets a chance to go to in a law school, and I was very fortunate. I actually went to school here when it was only about $14,000 a year. The bottom line is, there are some of the best attorneys out there who never went to law school. So what I'll tell you is we really need to emphasize education. Education in schools, but education for everybody. And that's not just children, that's for adults. 
the folks who are having trouble supporting themselves and can't get jobs, we need vocational type activities to help the adults as well. And then we will protect our democracy because we'll have people who can engage. Um, wow, I've got 12 seconds, so let me sum that up. We really need to do a better job with our schools. And we need to do it with what we have. And I'm serious about that. And I don't have just a concept, I just don't have time to tell you how. Thanks, Mark. You don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> our next uh, candidate is Becca White. Uh, I would have two, well, first of all, public education is vital. Uh, I have two points on this. As a Hartford High Hurricane graduate, UVM graduate, I can walk the talk on that one. Um, the two points I want to talk about is mental health care. Um, our schools have been just deluged with the difficult increased behavioral problems and mental health crisis that has just come out of COVID-19, has come from substance abuse disorder in family systems. It is so difficult to be a teacher right now, to be an educator. So to be able to support them where the mental health care costs are not weighing down our public school budgets, that's an area we need to focus on. And then the second is to reintroduce legislation that Senator McCormick and Senator Clarkson and I introduced, which carved out St. Johnsbury Academy, Thetford Academy, and Burn Burton so that we didn't have the Carson v. Macon Supreme Court decision affect our state, what was constitutionally trusted Thank public schools Becca. be taken out of public education funding. Thank you. And now we'll call on Jonathan Gleason. Education in my life has always been very important. Both of my teacher, both of my parents were school teachers. My mom worked at a public school and my dad at a private school. So yes, I agree. Education is paramount to maintaining and having a good society. Without it, the middle class will become eviscerated. They have no chance at climbing up the social scales and so forth and providing themselves with a good working economy. What would I do? I, when I look at the system that we have and when I attend the school board meetings, I'm surprised by the acrimony. And board member after board member has said to me, Act 46, Act 46. I believe we don't need to take it away entirely, but it needs to be looked at. We need to take some of the things that it has done and fix it, that's all. The direction of it is great. It's the apparatus that just needs to be tweaked. Thank you, and now on the House side, we hear first this time from Bruce Post. Okay, thank you. Yes, public education is critical. Um, and there are lots of things that need to be looked at. I'm not sure what has been looked at, how thoroughly it's been looked at. One of the ideas that I've heard is our state is so small in population that one supervisory union could cover the whole state. And we have several that are costing us a considerable amount of money. Um, another one is vocational schools. If we could continue to focus on vocational schools and maybe even get partnering from industry to help us with that, I think that could be beneficial to both industry and our society as a whole. So those are the two things that come to mind right away. Thank you. And now, John O'Brien. Yes, I agree that public education is vital to democracy. Um, just looking at Tunbridge, what, Emily, we had 21 one-room schoolhouses in Tunbridge. So uh, that sort of the importance of education goes way back here. And being at Vermont Law School, our respect for law, I think, is the other thing that's really vital to democracy. Um, I went to Chelsea High School, very small little school, and then to Harvard. So I, I had the benefits of a great rural education here. Um, I think that one, one thing that hasn't come up here, I agree with most of what's been said here, is that Vermont usually ranks like last or next to last in our support of higher education. And we should definitely support that more. It's more money, but, but we're really dropping the ball on Vermont State University and UVM. Thank you. Thank you. So the final voter question that we'll have time for tonight is about health care. And it is a relatively long question. I'll try to condense it once again. So just last week, there was a lot of publicity surrounding a consultant's report that was published 
suggesting a variety of reforms, some of them significant, to the healthcare delivery system here in Vermont. And so the question is, uh, if you were in the Vermont legislature, how do you think we should address the issues posed in that report, or more generally, the reforms that you'd like to see with regard to healthcare delivery here in Vermont? I feel a little guilty that I've been calling all the senatorial candidates first and relegating the House candidates second, and that's not right. Those two chambers are of equal dignity in our bicameral legislature. So what I think we'll do this time, you've probably never seen this done before, we'll just go down the road. And I'll ask John O'Brien to go first, and then we'll come right all the way up here to Jack Williams for the final question on health care. Can you just give us the question again? I would, it was sure. Long. I'll give you the question again. I was a little verbose. <laughs> there was recently a consultant's report suggesting all sorts of reforms with regard to our health care system. But more generally, what I think citizens want to hear from you is as a member of the legislature, what kinds of changes do you think are important to our health care system in this state? Well, I, I support, I think, revisiting this idea of universal health care or, or um, at least, you know, primary care because I think we still, there's too much involvement with, with big insurance in our health care system. And I think all of us, um, we're, it's just this weird sort of middle thing where we, it's hard enough to, to pay for our health care, but then we also have to make insurance companies affordable too. Um, I think in this, from what I heard in this consultants thing, like Gifford Hospital, um, they they had plans to um, to more or less completely change it into something that um, we wouldn't recognize anymore. And I I think these little hospitals like Gifford and Copley are really important. And I I would I would do everything I could to to keep them vital in their communities. Thank you. Bruce, you're next. Okay, one minute on something I know absolutely nothing about. Let's see. Um, what would be important if I were in the legislature? I think to be able to, to regulate but be able to keep the community spirit, I think that's very important. Most of the the small hospitals were actually started as kind of like volunteer things, if I understand it right. Um, and it's grown into something considerably different than that. Um, so how do, you, how do you bring back that volunteer spirit? I, I don't know. I don't know that it's possible now. Um, but I think there, again, more collaboration, more people putting in ideas and choosing the best of those ideas to help move things forward. Well, I got. Thank you. Allison, you're next. Thank you. This is a terrific report. It's 144 pages long, and I encourage us all to at least read the executive summary because we all treasure our small hospitals. They all uh, do incredible things for our communities, and I think my number one concern is access to health care uh, for our constituents and for all Vermonters. Uh, I think that this report has some great ideas in it. I think it is. Uh, suggesting that each hospital specialize in its own way, not that they go away, but that we be more efficient in our delivery of health care through our small regional hospitals. Uh, I'm so proud of Springfield, which has really turned itself around and come from the brink of ba from out of bankruptcy into uh, it's radically rethought how it delivers health care. And I was surprised it was named as one of the hospitals that needed to change gear. But um, I think that's what's important for our constituents is access to health care. Uh, I think if we do it more efficiently, that's a good thing and more effectively financially. And I absolutely support us going to a universal single payer health care system. That would solve a lot of this. Thank you. Joe Major, we'll hear from you. Thank you. Uh, as a small business uh, executive, one of the things that is very difficult is recruitment and the recruitment of nurses in particular. Visiting nurses cost hospitals an exponential amount of money. We need to grow our nurses internally within the state and keep them here. The other thing is par possibly partnerships with larger, like DHMC, organizations. 
That way they can absorb some of the costs. And finally, telehealth is one of the things, maybe an advancing thing that uh, can help us from becoming healthcare deserts, which was a, a term that I heard, which uh, is, is scary in rural Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Becca White. Thank you. Um, the three ideas that I would bring to the table would first be reference-based pricing, which highly recommend a Google of. We got an auditor's report, but it shows a significant decrease in healthcare costs using kind of a premium negotiation strategy that the state runs kind of incredible and cool, um, and saw potentially millions of dollars in savings. The second would be continuing my work on the community nurse program. Uh, Sharon, Heartland, Norwich, and maybe one day South Royalton could have access to community care or community nurse programs, which support preventative medical treatment for mainly our aging population who they're missing medications, and then they're ending up in the emergency room. They're having minor falls because their home isn't set up. Someone being in their home could identify those places and not pass down larger costs later on. And then the last piece that concerns me is traveling nurses. I brought it up when we had the meeting with the Scutney Hospital and again with Springfield Hospital. We cannot afford traveling nurses. Thank you. And next, Mark Nemeth. <clears throat> The issue for any organization is to make sure that they have the resources to provide the services. Simple as that. You have to have adequate staffing. It's not just hospitals. It's our court systems. Our courts don't have enough just judges um, or staff. Our hospitals don't have enough nurses or doctors. Our police departments don't have enough police officers or, or administrators. We have to fix that. That's a systemic problem. We need to go right to that. As far as access, the bottom line is you need to have health care accessibility. Those are the two things, by the way, that this report focused on, was accessibility and efficiency. We need to be able to make sure the folks don't have to worry about MVP falling down. We have to, I'm sorry, Blue Cross Blue Shield is the one that ran into trouble, not MVP. If you don't have health insurance, you're not going to be able to access the system, and that's what we really need to focus on. Thank you. Andrea Murray? So I have to say, Becca, we agree on um, the community nursing. It's a phenomenal program that it helps keep our seniors and um, our community healthier. But the universal health care, if you think this Clean Heat Act standard is going to be expensive, you haven't seen nothing yet. Plus, you will have a bureaucrat that's going to decide whether your um, health care service that your doctor's ordered, whether or not you can qualify for that or if there's a cheaper service that you should try before you qualify for that. I grew up as an army brat in Germany, so I understand as socialized medicine and I understand government control of medical care through the TRICARE program, which is exactly what we had to do. So this is going to be based on taxes. We need to have a program. We cannot close our small community hospitals. They want to take away Springfield's emergency care. What are the rural communities going to do? How far do we have to drive to get emergency care for our seniors, the ones that can't drive, or our elderly, or the ones that are um, without transportation? Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Next, we'll call in Jonathan Gleason. The first stakeholder I would reach out to is the insurance companies. I'd reach out to the insurance companies and ask them, why are the rates going up year over year? What are your major cost drivers? Are there rules and regulations that we've put in place that are creating this? And if so, can we alleviate them? Can we work with you? How do we use a two-way street and find a solution that everybody in Vermont can make affordable? Next, I would reach out to the hospitals, ask them the same questions. Where are your cost drivers? What are your challenges? How can we help you? I'm not a healthcare expert, so I would ask the experts, the people in the field, how can we help you help us? And explain in plain English, this is the problem we're having, the costs, the costs, the costs. How can we get good delivery, good insurance, and to have an affordable rate for all Vermonters? Thank you, and last on this round is Jack Williams. I have a, a niece that had an embolism in her lungs about a month ago, and it started out in Granville, New York. 
they transferred her to the Rutland Hospital. From the Rutland Hospital, they transferred her to Dartmouth. She's been in life supports for a month. And one thing I've learned from that is in this country, we have the most unbelievable, excellent medical system you've ever seen in your life. The problem is cost. Now, two things. I'm going to touch on what Andrea brought up and what Jason brought up, or Jonathan brought up. We need all the hospitals that, that we have. Our small hospitals in Rutland, in different places, but the cost, if you take all the insurance companies in this whole nation and open the insurance companies up to compete for the cost, the insurance companies will be the ones that will solve the cost problems because they will compete Thanks, and yep. we will get the best care. Thank you. Thank you. So we've now reached the final uh, closing statement segment of the forum. And I think once again, I'll ask the two House candidates to go first, and then I'll ask the Senate candidates in a random order to go second. I will say that those of you that have traveled across this country or around the world may have noticed that there are jurisdictions in which a red stoplight is treated as the law. You're supposed to stop. But there are also places where it's more in the nature of a kind of a suggestion. You know, it's a guideline. <laughs> so I've been very tough on making people stop after one minute, but I'm going to give you a little more flexibility here in the very last part. So if you're finishing a thought, finishing a sentence, uh, take a few extra seconds. Um, but we'll be watching, so don't abuse this freedom. You know, with freedom comes responsibility. But within your judgment, take a minute to share a closing thought or statement of any kind that you wish to share. And let's begin once again with the House candidates. And John O'Brien, I'll have you go first. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, let me just tell a quick story. So remember when, when ARPA dollars flowed down from the federal government to our towns, every town got a, a lot of money we weren't expecting. Um, Humbridge got, I think, around $400,000. I think Royalton got a bit more. Um, so on the select board, we had to decide where this money's going to go. And people in town, we had, we had town-wide conversations, um, listened to the people. And, and we decided, among other things, well, South Royalton Rescue is going to build a new um, permanent home. And being in their coverage district, um, there was a request for 25000 and we said, yeah, great idea. Then in Chelsea, um, there, there was a proposal for a dental hub to get a dentist. You know how hard it is to find a dentist these days. We said, OK, good idea. Meanwhile, uh, um, the Tumbridge Historical Society said, um, we would like to stabilize the North Tumbridge Church and use it as our home. The windows are falling out. We need um, 25000 for that. And we said, well, we love the Historical Society, and um, we think it's important that we preserve our cultural and historic um, legacy, but we don't have the money for it. So um, then my wife said, why don't we hold a haunted trail and raise money for the Historical Society to try to save this? And that's, that's what I think, as legislators, we have to do. There's, we have to prioritize listen to the community, say what's really important, and that's where our money goes. And then we have to be really creative for all those other important things that need to get done, too. Thanks, John. So that's why I'd like to go back to Montpelier. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Bruce Post. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to come and try to introduce myself and um, have a chance to speak on the issues. I think. I just want to leave you with my reasons for running. Um, number one, help restore common sense to Montpelier. Number two, make Vermont a uh, safer, more affordable place. And number three, to restore a voice to the common working people. All right, I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you. And now, again randomized, I'll invite Mark Nemeth to go first with a closing statement.
So for my last 60 seconds, I want you to see my face and the sincerity. I want you to see the smile that brings energy and eyes that bring truth. I wear a mask because I have a compromised immune deficiency as a result of chemotherapy that I started about two months ago. I was diagnosed with lymphoma. I thank God that I have access to health care in Vermont because anywhere else I don't think I'd be doing so well. I expect to be done probably around the time of January and I have a good prognosis and I believe that if I'm elected, I'm at 25% right now, I'll be at 100%. If you think I'm jacked right now, wait till you see me then. Um, so I just want you to understand that my doctor is gonna be kicking me when he finds out that I was here tonight because I'm not supposed to be out in public. I came out tonight with my partner's blessing because I wanted you to know that I'm here, that I'm relevant and I'm offering you a solution. And with my last 10 seconds, I'm gonna tell you three things that I'm really gonna emphasize. One, live and serve well. Two, if you want to see a change, you need to consider doing something different, which means give some new folks a try, somebody you can count on. And last but not least, and this is the thing, let's educate and not mandate. And that's really gonna be my mantra when I go up to the, um, to the uh, uh, Senate. I'm available during the days, please reach out to me. I'd like to share my thoughts with you and I wanna hear your questions and concerns. Thank you. Thank you. We'll next hear from Joe Major. Thank you. I, I said this saying um, at another forum earlier, and it is uh, something that a clothier in Western New York said. And uh, they said, it's Cy Sims, and they said, an educated consumer is our best customer. So I wanna thank you for coming tonight and listening to all of us and becoming educated on what we stand for and the issues that are not only important to us, but more importantly, important to you. One of the things that I have done when I have traveled across this county is I have found that people in each municipality have their own issues and thoughts, and guess what? Each one is vitally important. So if I disagree with you, that's okay. What's going to happen is we're gonna work for a common good and try to do the best that we can to make sure that Vermont is truly a better place to live. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Becca White. Let me just echo Joe's comments on thanking you for coming. Um, I also want to thank you in advance for voting on November 5th. Um, and I also want to thank all the candidates for running. It is not easy to stand for elected office, and it's not easy to do it in your hometown. Um, so I wanted to just lift up a thank you to all the candidates um, and that's all I wanted to say there. Uh, I ran for select board when I was 20. I served there for four years. I ran for state rep, served there for four years, and now I'm hoping to serve you in a second term as your state senator. The thing that makes me different from any other candidate is that I prioritize constituent services. That means that it's not just legislation that we work on, it's making sure that you have access to government in a way that doesn't have a barrier put right up in front of you. So if you elect me, no matter what party you ascribe to or no party at all, uh, know that you can come to me and if there is a barrier to our government that you are facing, I want to hear about it. If you have a well-written piece of information about you know, Two Rivers Ottaquichi, I'll read it, even if I disagree. Because constituent services is the bulk of the work that I do as an elected leader, because it's not just four months out of the year. And I hope that anyone who is elected to that position will continue that tradition, uh, along with um, myself and Senator Clarkson. We're running as a team of three Democrats. We support each other. And if you'd like to volunteer or donate to our campaigns, we have literature with our websites Thanks, and all Becca. that information. So thank, thank you. you very much for coming. We'll now hear from Jack Williams. Every two years, the people of Vermont have the opportunity to vote for a candidate who will represent the will of the people and the best interest of Vermont. This is a civic duty 
that shouldn't be taken lightly. Because remember, what you sow in November, you will reap the next two years. So as a candidate, I'm asking you to support my candidacy for the next month and a half. I'm asking for your vote in November. And my pledge to you is I will serve you, or will serve the will of the people, and I will serve in the best interest of Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we'll hear from Jonathan Gleason. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate your time. It's always hard to be away from home and so forth on a school night, but we're all out late. I hope that the primary takeaway in learning about me tonight is that you find me a moderate. I'm not a hard right Republican. I'm not somebody who's going to vote entirely and exclusively along party lines. My mantra is I agree with a lot of what the Democrats want to do. What I don't agree with all the time is the rate and timing of the movements. Maybe I want to have goals, they want to have mandates. That's the difference between myself and the Democrats that are running the state right now. I'm not looking to make massive radical changes. I think Vermont's great. I think we need to perpetuate what we have, grow it, and incentivize the younger people to stay. Again and again, I will say that we need to make it more affordable for the younger people to stay here, have a thriving economy, be able to afford houses and educate themselves and provide for a family. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And next, we'll hear from Allison Clarkson. Thank you, Jonathan. I agree with a lot of that. Uh, thank you for this lively forum. This has been terrific. I appreciate the opportunity to share our views and our values, and I hope you have a good sense of all of that from each of us. I love representing the Windsor District. Uh, every year I get to know different aspects of our 25 towns better, and I meet more people, and enjoy the different town traditions and our district's incredible natural resources. Uh, legislators are not just lawmakers. We are active teammates working to improve our communities. We're problem solvers, and we work hard advocating for our constituents, as Becca has just discussed. I love my work as a legislator, and I'd appreciate your vote to send me back into the fray to continue the work we need to do to deliver for the people of Vermont, saving our environment, supporting our children and families, working to keep Vermont affordable and livable. Uh, and, and if elected, I will bring my energy and enthusiasm to the Senate on your behalf. With the values and experience I bring to the legislature, I believe I can make a difference in the lives of Vermonters and the well-being of our state. Thank you so much. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> and our last candidate for the night is Andrea Murray. So I'm running for the Vermont State Senate um, because I care deeply about the future of Vermont, Vermonters, our kids, and our lives. Um, I'm worried about the rising costs, the increased taxes, the state government that feels out of touch with the regular Vermonters. The families are struggling to keep up. Parents are worried about our kids, um, the education. The people feel that they're being ignored. So I believe. But Vermont can be a place where we can afford to live, where we can thrive, and we can grow as a community. There are so many opportunities to do that. Um, I'm not a career politician, but um, I do have the life experience that I understand the impacts of the legislation that I'm voting for, how it affects everyday Vermonters. <clears throat> there was a specific statement about Act 130. Before you choose who to vote for, I'd ask you to read the bill read the act, because it is absolutely what I said it was, and I would ask you to verify, because I'm not a politician. I'm going to sh shoot straight, and I'm going to let you know, and I'm going to fight for you, because I'm an expert at reading legislation and reading documents <laughs> and reviewing to get the best possible legislation for our Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I'll just betcha that none of you thought we would conclude this program on time. But we have. 
Let me share with you a few closing thoughts. Uh, our time collectively as participants in this forum, of course, has expired, but our citizenship and our time as citizens has not. You heard, and I want to reinforce, that what you saw tonight is not easy, and we should be thankful as a country, and we should be thankful as a state, and we should be thankful as a community, that there are fine people who really care, who are willing to put yourselves out there in front of others, who are willing to engage in rational discourse in a civilized way, and who are willing to give back to society. So whatever you think of the particular views of the candidates, you should be thankful and proud. I will say this to the candidates. I have the good fortune to be a constitutional law lawyer, and I argue cases in state and federal courts all over the country. And in some of the courts, federal and state, when the argument is concluded, the judges or justices do a wonderful thing. They come off the bench, they come down to the advocate's table, and they shake their hands. And so when we conclude tonight, you have your choice of a wave, a hand bump, a handshake, but as a token of my respect and thanks for you being willing to do what you're doing, I'd like to shake of some form everyone's hands. Let me thank all the people that were part of creating this event. Many people in the community were here from all of the different sponsoring organizations. They volunteered. Many of our students at the school volunteered. A large number of our staff members here at the school volunteered. And of course, as you've already been thanked, you took valuable time to come here and participate in our democracy. So I invite us all to have a collective round of applause. The candidates for you and you for the candidates and for all who supported tonight.